with Derek. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so um, just to kind of recall where we uh, stopped yesterday, um, I introduced uh, this kind of you know, minimal model of atom-light interactions in 1D, which is a chiral waveguide. Um, so basically light could only propagate in one direction and interact with atoms uh, without backscattering. Um, so you know, I, I said that you know, it kind of seems like an artificial model because how could you have you know, light propagating in one direction but not uh, the other? Um, but it turns out it's not, uh, you know, completely artificial. So uh, I'd like to actually uh, spend the first few minutes of this lecture um, kind of talking a little bit about some physical systems where you can realize, uh, you know, quasi-one-dimensional atom-light interactions. And also discuss, you know, in what circumstances you can actually realize a chiral uh, interaction where uh, atoms truly can only talk to light uh, propagating in one direction. Um, okay, so uh, th there's different platforms in which you can uh, potentially realize waveguide QED. Um, maybe the kind of first one historically was uh, with real atoms. And so uh, around, uh, actually 15 years ago, um, Arno Rauschenbeutel's group uh, was able to realize cold atoms coupled to optical nanofibers. Um, so a nanofiber is just, it starts from just a normal glass fiber. And then what you can do is you can actually uh, uh, put it under a flame and pull it until some region uh, becomes very thin. So, you know, just kind of a few hundred nanometers in diameter. Um, so it turns out that uh, no matter how thin the, the fiber is, there's no cutoff. So in principle, light can still be guided uh, through uh, the fiber. Um, but at the same time, the diffraction limit still has a hold. So you, you, it doesn't make sense that you can kind of confine light arbitrarily tightly. So actually what happens when you pull the fiber to be very thin is that even though the kind of core, the refractive index region is, is very thin, um, basically you know, to obey the diffraction limit, a lot of the light, um, even though it's guided, actually you know, starts to live outside the fiber core and in the vacuum region. Okay? And so once these guided modes leak into the vacuum region, on one hand, you can use uh, those optical fields to trap atoms. So you can form optical lattices uh, for, for trapped atoms, just like you do in, in free space. Um, so that's kind of what's illustrated here. There's a kind of 1D lattice, a uh, set of sites along 1D, where atoms can potentially be, be trapped. Um, and then in practice, uh, you know, uh, when you overlap a cloud of cold atoms around the system, uh, about kind of 50% of, of the potential sites will actually be filled with atoms. Um, so in these systems, uh, they're, they're quite long, so you can easily have kind of a few thousand atoms uh, coupled to uh, this nanofiber. And once the atoms are there, uh, you know, also by the fact that you know, the, the guided modes leak into the vacuum region, that also gives a mechanism for the atoms to interact with near resonant photons that are guided by, by the nanofiber. So that's how you realize basic chiral, or sorry, how you realize waveguide QED. Um, so kind of a priori, you'd expect that you know, if an atom is excited, uh, there's some probability uh, or some rate which will emit into the guided modes of the system. And then you know, the system obviously looks mirror symmetric from the standpoint of the atom. So you might guess that half the time, you know, uh, the photon emits right, half the time emits left. Um, unfortunately, you know, the atom is not a true 1D system. The atom does know about, you know, 4 pi. And so there's uh, uh, actually a significant fraction of the time the atom actually emits a light, uh, light into 4 pi rather than the guided modes. And so for these nanofiber systems, unfortunately, that branching ratio is quite low. Um, only about 5% of the photons uh, for a single atom will go into the guided Modes. So it's not a kind of 100% uh, efficient interaction, but that's kind of uh, the reality of, of that system. Um, 
starting from that experiment, you know, so people realize that this kind of 5% doesn't seem particularly nice, you know, if you want to do highly coherent uh, operations. And so um, one of the kind of platforms that was pursued after the nanofiber uh, is this so-called uh, photonic crystal waveguide. Um, so a photonic crystal waveguide more or less starts from you know, a nanofiber. So a nanofiber is kind of unstructured, or it's translation invariant you know, along the direction of propagation. And then what a photonic crystal is, is basically a, a nanofiber, some kind of waveguide uh, that's periodically modulated. Um, so this object still guides light. Um, just to draw an analogy with uh, you know, solid state physics and electrons uh, you know, in, in periodic potentials, um, you might expect that you know, just like you know, electrons and periodic potentials are described by block you know, band structure, um, so are the guided photons in this case. So the fact that you have this periodic modulation means that the propagation of light uh, through the structure is not necessarily trivial, uh, but it all of a sudden develops an optical band structure. And so a typical kind of band structure, if you look at kind of frequency versus block wave vector, might look like this. You get a set of guided bands, um, also uh, with uh, band gaps. Okay? So this is due to kind of multiple scattering within the structure itself. Um, the multiple scattering might become so strong that in certain uh, frequency regimes, uh, just uh, light propagation is no longer allowed, period. So you, you develop an optical band gap. And then um, what's kind of neat about these systems is near the band gap, you see that you know, if you look at the slope of this dispersion relation, as you uh, approach the, the band edge or the band gap, uh, the, the slope or the group velocity goes to zero. Okay? And physically what's happening is that you know, light is no longer kind of propagating straight through the system. It's taking multiple bounces you know, back and forth. Uh, you know, so it might take kind of three steps forward and two steps back. And so then from the standpoint of the atom, the photon is effectively hitting the atom uh, you know, several times over. Uh, that allows you to enhance the coupling efficiency. Um, so I guess there's no kind of uh, fundamental limit, but uh, in kind of experiments so far, they can get maybe a kind of you know, order of magnitude increase in the branching ratio between you know, emission into the guided modes uh, versus four pi. Um, one of the big kind of bottlenecks of these systems is that um, these are, you know, the, the, the spatial region in which atoms can potentially be trapped is actually very small. It's much smaller than in a nanofiber. And so even though you kind of have like one atom, you know, per trapping site, if you kind of extrapolate that to a density, it's actually a very high atomic density comparable to a BEC. And so, again, there's no kind of fundamental uh, rule that prohibits you from tr uh, uh, coupling many atoms to the structure. But it's turned out to be a kind of big uh, experimental challenge to really load the, the traps, the trapping sites with atoms. So the state of the art is that you get reasonable coupling efficiency, but only a few atoms coupled uh, uh, at any uh, one time. Um, and then there's superconducting qubits, which you know, coming from me, coming from atomic physics, seems like kind of cheating. Okay. Um, so basically, you know, you can have uh, standard superconducting qubits like a transmon. And a transmon has a typical uh, resonance frequency in the, in the microwave regime. And then you can simply you know, design some kind of effective microwave waveguide, a superconducting transmission line. And then um, uh, you know, just kind of due to the peculiarities of, of microwave systems or differences with optics, um, it turns out you can very easily get uh, branching ratios that are very high. So uh, at least 99% of the emission uh, from a single transmon will go into the guided modes versus into uh, other uh, channels. Okay, so this starts to look like kind of ideal 1D uh, waveguide physics. Um, again, there's a kind of problem in, in superconducting qubits that when you make one or when you make two, uh, they're not generically going to be identical. So you have to learn how to tune different qubits into, into resonance with one another. And so um, the state of the art in this system is that you get very good kind of single transmon coupling, but if you really want a kind of few near identical uh, qubits uh, coupled to the same transmission line, then you can only couple a few, or that's kind of you know, the state of the art uh, so far. Um, so what I drew here is kind of like a, a featureless transmission line, so it's you know, uh, uh, translation invariant along the direction of propagation. 
you can actually play similar tricks. So instead of making a kind of unstructured transmission line, you can start to structure it. And then you can also build uh, within this circuit QED things that look like uh, photonic crystals as well. Um, so in all the pictures so far, it seemed like, you know, uh, so uh, you know, I argue that you can create kind of quasi 1D uh, you know, waveguides for, for atoms or artificial atoms to couple to. Um, in all the pictures, it kind of looks like the system is mirror symmetric, right? So if I have an excited atom, I'd expect that the cartoon looks like this, where half the time it emits a photon propagating to the right, half the time uh, to the left. Uh, but it turns out that even though the system looks you know, perfectly mirror symmetric, it doesn't have to be true. Okay? Um, so let me now try to argue why uh, that's the case and, and what's kind of missing from this you know, cartoon picture that I drew before. Um, it really comes from the kind of vectorial nature of electromagnetic fields. Um, so just to kind of you know, review very basic uh, you know, classical ENM, um, you know, the simplest solutions of the wave equation are just plane waves, right? So if I have uh, a plane wave, let's, see, let's say with components in the x and z direction, then I have a k vector uh, with components along x and z. And then of course, the electric field has a polarization uh, where the polarization vector uh, has to be perpendicular to the direction of propagation. Right? Um, so basically, you know, kx and kz just define some propagation angle in the xz plane. Um, and then, you know, if you want to, if you want this kind of plane wave to actually satisfy the wave equation, uh, it has to satisfy, satisfy a dispersion relation, right? So the frequency of this wave and the wave vector itself can't be arbitrary but they have to satisfy that kx squared plus kz squared is omega over c squared. So you know, this is kind of basic optics that, that everyone knows. Um, and this is what you would call kind of radiation waves. So there's really a sense that kx and kz define a direction of propagation. And then you know, the, the um, k vector or the, um, sorry, the, the polarization vector is orthogonal to your propagation direction. Um, but the point is that actually, you know, we, we kind of are used to dealing with these uh, kx and kz being real. But actually, if you look mathematically from the standpoint of Maxwell's equations, Maxwell's equations don't care. So what I said here is true, period. In particular, it would still be true if I took uh, the magnitude of kz to be bigger than omega over c. And then, uh, then the only way I can satisfy this dispersion relation is if kx squared is negative, or equivalently if kx itself is purely imaginary. Okay, so it's a perfectly valid mathematical solution of Maxwell's equations. Um, so if that's the case, then we can you know, take you know, kx to be i kappa x and just simply plug it into the same equations here. And, and so mathematically it's straightforward to do, but actually the physical consequences are, are quite amazing. So if you make that transformation or that replacement, then all of a sudden uh, you get what well, looks like an evanescent wave. Okay, so uh, along the x direction, the field, the field is evanescently or exponentially decaying. And now um, I think of propagation as being along the z direction purely, okay? because the x direction def you know, defines an evanescent decay. And I only pick up kind of phase propagating along z. Um, the other thing, though, is that when you look at this kind of polarization vector, it looks very different, right? Because now I have the sense that I'm propagating a field along z, but I have polarization components uh, both uh, along x, which is perpendicular to my propagation direction, but also I have a component of my uh, uh, polarization that's in the direction of propagation itself. So that's something that you know probably most of you are not used to dealing with an electromagnetism. Okay. And furthermore, there's a factor of i, which means that it's really kind of like a, it's not like a linear polarization, but it's more like an elliptical or, or circular polarization. So you have the sense that you know, the light is propagating this way, and as it propagates, the kind of you know, polarization is rotating, but tilted into the plane or into the direction of propagation. Um, and more or less, if you kind of you know, played with the sinusoid, if I flip the direction of, of propagation, then actually the uh, polarization would flip as well. So for example, it would switch from being sigma minus to sigma plus polarized. 
And you can kind of see this here. You have light propagating this way. If you look, um, so, so sorry, uh, what, I, what I analyzed so far is just true for kind of you know, plane waves. Um, but it turns out to be generally true. So I didn't you know, specifically solve for a nanofiber. Um, but the story will also be the same. So if I have a nanofiber, I have a guided mode propagating in this direction. If I look above the, the nanofiber, I'll have a kind of elliptical polarization oriented in one direction, let's say sigma minus. But if I flip the direction of propagation, then uh, above the fiber, the orientation will change to sigma plus. And so now we can go back to this story here. Um, this kind of extra polarization degree of freedom and the fact that you have this kind of you know, uh, a locking of the direction of propagation to the orientation of polarization, that's actually the kind of hidden degree of freedom, if you want, to allow this kind of breaking of mirror symmetry. Uh, so in particular, uh, imagine I have a single atom and it's trapped above uh, the nanofiber. Um, if I have a realistic atom, I get a you know, so a real atom has, uh, uh, like if I think about a hydrogen atom, you know, the ground state is 1s. And then if I think about the first excited states, these 2p states, there's actually three different polarizations, x, y, and z. And so in the lab, I effectively get to, I actually get to choose, you know, which one I can couple to. And so, for example, if I choose an excited state polarization, uh, where the ground to excited state transition is actually sigma minus oriented itself, then you can see that you know, if light propagating one direction might couple, you know, might actually be sigma minus and couple to this atom. Uh, whereas in the opposite case, uh, that would not be true. Okay? So due to the fact that I'm effectively breaking the, the time reversal symmetry by kind of applying a magnetic field or choosing which uh, internal transition of the atom I'm talking to, I can guarantee that this kind of sigma minus transition only talks to light propagating in one direction and not the other. And this is something that has been measured in these kind of nanofiber experiments. Um, they get, I think, close to 90% directionality um, experimentally observed. Okay. Um, so this is a kind of nice illustration that this kind of chiral waveguide uh, Hamiltonian, which a priori seems a little bit uh, strange, actually is a very physical system. Um, the only kind of catch is that you know, what I described so far in lecture is really true 1D, so an excited atom has to emit into the guided modes. Um, of course, in this system here, even though you have this high directionality, you also have this high probability that a photon is still emitted into 4 pi. Um, so that, it turns out you can also do the same thing in, in waveguide QED systems with, um, uh, with, with transmons. In that case, uh, you just kind of use the trick that a transmon is you know, actually very big. So you can have the notion of you know, a, a physical waveguide, and then you can kind of make your atom or your uh, you know, artificial atom uh, so big that it's not a point-like emitter anymore. So the physical size is like some appreciable fraction of the wavelength of light. And so then you can kind of design your atom to actually couple to the waveguide in two physically different positions. You can play with the phases uh, which those, that um, uh, the, the atom couples to the waveguide. Uh, the relative phase uh, between these two coupling points. You kind of see that here. So the waveguide in this experiment is actually kind of uh, curved around. You have your atom here, and it's physically coupled to these two different points. And once you have this kind of non-point-like emitter, that allows you to kind of break the, the mirror symmetry of the system. Uh, they all can also observe uh, above 99% uh, directionality. In this case, it, all is, it is almost ideal 1D waveguide QED in the sense that you know, when the transmon is excited, almost with 100% probability, it does emit into the guided modes. Okay. Um, so this was just meant to be a kind of brief exposition to experimental platforms. If, uh, for those of you who are uh, not very familiar with uh, quantum optics or waveguide QED. Um, So the, the problem of the scalability is because you need two transmon qubits to mediate the interaction between the main transmon and the waveguide? I'm sorry? Uh, because uh, as I can see from the figure, uh -huh. I suppose you have two transmon qubits coupled to the central qubit, mm -hmm. and these two-sided transmon are coupled to the waveguide. Is that correct? 
I, I think it's actually just one transmon. Um, I think all the rest of, so I'm not a circuit QED person, but I think the rest of the, the system is basically some kind of parametric driving, which allows you to define the phase, uh, relative phase at which this uh, one transmon couples to the waveguide. So that's my impression, but uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not a circuit QED person, so I can't. Oh, oh okay. No, because uh, from the circuit, the purple uh, elements there looks like transmon qubits because you have drive lines compared to it out there. And you have a middle main transmon. Uh -huh. Okay, but because uh, f uh, phi, phi L and phi R, mm -hmm. they are two level systems or not? I don't believe so. I, I think uh, they're really just parametric uh, coupling. Okay. But, but again, I'm not an expert, so I would defer to anyone who knows better. <laughs> I have a question related to the previous slide. Uh -huh. I mean, you use this trick of uh, selection rules to give the di directionality, but after this atom it emits, it also satisfies the selection rule in order to keep uh, with the with the idea of directionality. Um, that that depends. So. Um, so the the way the the system works is that. Uh, Right, so, so a real atom, uh, so if you have a simple atom like hydrogen, then you have a unique ground state. So if you go up to this excited state, you emit a sigma minus photon, and then another photon comes, which is also propagating in the dire same direction, it would also drive you back up to the same excited state. So a, a real atom, or, or well, not a real atom, like uh, a, a, a more typical alkali atom that people use. Uh, there's hyperfine structure, so there's actually not just one ground state, but there could be, you know, a whole multiplet of you know ground states and excited states. So I'm not sure if this, if this is what you're asking, but you know, if you kind of start up in this excited state, okay, if it's you know, if you emit a guided photon, then maybe you can guarantee that. You know, it only talks to one direction by, by what I said there. Um, but, uh, oh, sorry. So right, like, so if you if you emitted a guided photon with this sigma minus or sigma plus polarization, then you know that photon would go in a well-defined direction. But there's nothing that stops you, for example, from emitting a photon, right? And so um, you only get this kind of pure chirality or fixed chirality if you want, if your atom is in you know this manifold here. So you've maximized uh, the Zeeman number, and then just because that this thing is already maximized, there's actually not a ground state. So this is possible, but there's no state uh, that it can emit into in the kind of sigma minus orientation. So right. So for kind of more realistic atomic structure with hyperfine uh, structure, you, you want the so-called cycling or closed transition uh, to really duplicate uh, what I'm saying here. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, again, last time we, we ended with uh, this kind of chiral waveguide, and I showed you this beta onsatz uh, to calculate single photon scattering. Um, I argued that it's, you know, that in principle you can you know, calculate it for instead of one photon, two photons, three photons, uh, but it rapidly becomes very inefficient. And I also said that the beta onsatz is very particular. So if I add anything else to the Hamiltonian, you know, Rydberg interactions, or, or I, I broke the chirality of the waveguide, um, the, the beta onsatz just uh, doesn't generalize anymore. Um, so then it's kind of clear that if we want to talk about atom-light interactions more generally, uh, we, didn't, we need a more flexible framework you know, beyond chiral waveguide and beta onsatz. 
And uh, that's what I would like to uh, gradually introduce um, in, in this lecture. Um, but to really you know, uh, introduce the formalism, I also have to first introduce a little bit of uh, open quantum system uh, theory. Um, so maybe just is, can I get a show of hands of how many people have heard of or used Lindblad master equations before? OK, so, um, so what I'll try to do is I'll, I'll try to give a minimal introduction to, to Lindblad master equations and open systems just to make sure everyone's on the same page. Um, we won't have to really kind of use the formalism very heavily. Um, so if you're not familiar with all the details, don't worry about it. Um, hopefully the, the main ideas that I'll introduce will be sufficient uh, for understanding the later content. Okay. Um, so first, just a, you know, I think everyone you know at least is a little bit familiar with density matrices. But let me just kind of repeat the, the key ideas of, of what a density matrix is in the first place, and kind of you know the ways you can manipulate a density matrix uh, to calculate observables. Um, so just to review, if we have a closed uh, system, so something that uh, obeys uh, you know Schrodinger's equation. Uh, then we can describe a system just by uh, pure states. Okay. Okay. Um, on the other hand, or sorry, let me. Um, so that can't possibly be a, a kind of sufficient uh, description of all uh, quantum systems in general, um, because if that's true, then all of a sudden, you know, uh, you know, evolution would be perfectly unitary. Quantum computers would work, you know, starting now. Um, and so somebody has to obviously kill uh, quantum computers, and that's the fact that you have some kind of dissipation or decoherence. Okay? Um, so that's why you need a kind of density matrix description of of more general quantum systems. Um, and so, just to review, uh, a density matrix, if I have a, a, a pure state, um, is nothing more than um, you know, the ket of this pure state times the bra. Okay, so this is if I have a pure state. And so if I think of you know, psi of t, the, the state as a vector, then rho of t is just uh, a, a matrix, okay? uh, or a Whatever uh, a row a row vector sorry column vector times a row vector right um, but it turns out that you know a, uh, this kind of formulation is easy to generalize uh, to a system that is not evolving purely coherently um, so uh, more generally um, I can write uh, my uh, density matrix as a classical probability distribution over a set of pure states. Okay. Um, where on one hand, you know, the sum of probabilities, so PM is a set of probabilities, so they're positive, and they sum to one, and then um, Turns out you can always write a density matrix uh, in a form in terms of a set of orthogonal uh, basis vectors. Okay, and so the kind of physical interpretation again uh, is that you know this object here, this more general object, represents a classical mixture. Uh, 
of quantum states. So for example, uh, if M was you know, either one or two, then it means that with some probability, you know, P1, I'm giving you a pure quantum state, psi1, and with some probability, P2, I'm giving you a pure quantum state, psi2. Um, and then kind of observables also generalize in, in a similar manner. So uh, if I have an observable, um, uh, I calculate the expectation value as the overlap of psi O uh, psi. And then uh, more generally, uh, starting from a density matrix description, I would take the trace of the operator and uh, the density matrix. Um, the next thing you can look at is you know, equations of motion. Um, so if you have a pure state, you know, it's pretty simple. It's just the usual uh, Schrodinger equation. Um, and then if you try to generalize this, you would say, well, uh, if I can represent, if I can write down rho of t in this form here, uh, then I would just kind of apply the Schrodinger equation uh, to the individual states. And this you can write as the commutator. So d rho dt is proportional to the commutator of h and rho. Okay? And this is true for uh, pure unitary evolution. Okay? Um, so, okay, so, so this is true, but then you can see there's still kind of something missing, right? Because, uh, I mean, why do I need a density matrix if I'm only account, gonna account for pure unitary evolution that I can just, you know, go back to pure states and usual Schrodinger picture? You know, of course, the reason that we're going to density matrix in the first place is we know that something bad is gonna happen to our system that we can't control. So we need some kind of framework to talk about evolution uh, in the presence of a dissipative or decohering Bath, okay. Um, so, right. So then you can ask, you know, what about dissipation? Um. So the most general case is actually you know, arbitrarily complicated. Um, so in particular, if I have some kind of you know, notion of a system, like a, a spin, then of course, you know, if I have some decohering mechanism, I can also treat the, the degrees of freedom that interact with the spin also as part of a bigger system. Right? So I can have the notion of you know, uh, a system You know, as a concrete example, this might be atoms. Um, and then they might couple via some interaction uh, to what I'll call uh, a bath, uh, which in our you know, uh, case of interest might be photons. Uh, but I can always do this, right? I can take any you know, system consisting of multiple particles. I can always make some arbitrary cut to say that you know this set of degrees of freedom is a system, and this degree of uh, these degrees of freedoms are a bath, okay? 
And so it's clear that if I take the path to be large enough, you know, all the degrees of freedom of the universe, then all of a sudden I can you know, write down pure closed system evolution. So I can define a wave function covering both the system and bath degrees of freedom. Uh, this wave function would obey uh, the usual Schrodinger equation. Um, and then, you know, uh, I only get some kind of non unitary evolution if I try to integrate out the bath, right? So if I have some sense that I'm going to try and you know, come up with a description just of this part of the system alone, uh, then this you know, subsystem would generally be described as a density matrix. Okay, so the entire system in Bath is pure, but when I trace out part of uh, my giant system, I'll generally get a reduced matrix that is no longer pure. Um, so then, you know, formally, you can write down uh, an evolution equation uh, for the reduced density matrix just of the system. That would be uh, given by the evolution equation for the density matrix of the entire system in Bath, but then I trace out the Bath degrees of freedom. Okay. And the point is that when you do that, you know, this object here can be arbitrarily complicated. Okay? So it could be some very strange function of the system density matrix. And generally, um, in particular, it can be a function of the density matrix at previous times. Okay, so I get a, a, an equation that's non-local in time. Um, just to give a very artificial example, imagine I had a two-level system here. It can emit its excitation, go into the bath. The bath will simply kind of keep that excitation for, for one minute and send it back to the system. So then, you know, the system dynamics depend on the system state at one minute earlier in time. Okay. And so once you get this kind of non-locality in time, you know, kind of arbitrarily complicated stuff uh, can happen. Um, so what we're going to deal with is not kind of this arbitrarily complicated uh, situation, uh, but we'll interest, be interested in kind of Markovian uh, bath. Uh, Markovian is just to say that, you know, this thing will simplify Uh, so that it only depends on the density matrix. So d rho dt only depends on the de density matrix at the same time. Okay, so it's like the bath effectively has a very short memory time of the system at earlier times. Okay? Um, so uh, this, if you want, is kind of a definition of what it means to be Markovian. Right? There's no, uh, that everything becomes local in time. Um, in the case of atoms and photons, I'll show you a little bit later on uh, physically what it means to be Markovian versus non-Markovian. Um, but for now, I'll just kind of take this as a definition. All right. um, so it turns out that if you have Markovian dynamics, then all of a sudden, your, uh, the, the, general, the most general form that d rho dt can take on is actually very limited. Okay. Um, so if this is true, then I'll just simply claim that the most general form for d rho dt consists of one component that looks like pure unitary evolution under some system Hamiltonian. Um.
plus an object that looks like this, uh, where this thing is known as Lindblad, a Lindblad master equation or some Lindblad form. Okay, so I won't prove it, but you know, hopefully it looks kind of plausible. Okay, so one thing that you see is that it indeed is local in time, right? So this row is the same is valid at the same time as this row here. Um, one thing that you see is that if you try to take the trace of row, so the trace of row always has to be one to be a physical density matrix. And you see that if you try to take the trace of, of this thing here, or D, this component of D row to T, you know, the trace is cyclic, so you can move C dagger C over to this side, you can move this C dagger over here. And so then when you take the trace, you see that it's zero. So this type of form you know, preserves the trace. Um, so, so this is, you know, you can hopefully convince yourself that this is a proper uh, positive trace preserving uh, uh, form, okay? So it turns out that that is generally true. And now um, this kind of, you know, CI, uh, they're a so-called set of jump operators. So in principle, they could be anything. They don't have to be uh, Hermitian, okay? Um, but there's just some abstract operators acting on your system, All right? And you know, if, as long as CI is an operator acting on your system, this is at least a legal density matrix. Yes. Oh, this one? It's just convention. Um, you you could if you want, you could absorb the factor of one half into the jump operators. So it's a, it's just, it's just an arbitrary prefactor if you want. So any other questions? Um, no, I guess not. Any other questions? Okay, so um, we can also do one more thing. Uh, we can, uh, so historically in quantum optics, this is what you would call kind of the deterministic uh, part of the evolution. Um, and then this part here uh, would be called uh, the jump. Okay. Um, I'll explain a little bit, uh, well, just uh, next, you know, why these two terms have very different physical meanings or interpretations. Okay. Um, and, and that's why I kind of color-coded, you know, uh, the deterministic uh, uh, as one color and jump as, as another. Okay. Um, so let me just give a very practical example of, um, of a Lindblad form. Uh, so in particular, let's talk about single atom uh, spontaneous emission. Okay. Um, so the physical process that we want to capture is, you know, if we have one atom in the excited state, uh, we want to write down the master equation where essentially the excited state population decays exponentially and goes into the ground state at a rate gamma naught, physically by emitting a photon, but the photon we traced out as part of the bath. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to claim, or maybe if you want to guess, that there's one jump operator, which is the square root of gamma naught times sigma GE, or the spin lowering operator, right? Um, so it turns out that this type of jump operator, you know, the interpretation of this jump operator is pretty generic. Um, so, you know, what it means is that, you know, this jump operator takes the atom from the excited state 
to the ground state. So it describes kind of, you know, in a cartoonish way, where the population is going. And, and so if you just kind of take a, a, so then you can generalize this intuition to other types of systems, harmonic oscillator, et cetera, okay? Um, so uh, let me just kind of, you know, uh, take that as being given. Uh, and then uh, if I write down the Lindblad form, um, so here I don't have any coherent driving, so there's no uh, Hermitian Hamiltonian. So all I have to do is evaluate this object here. Um, so this gives me minus gamma naught over two. Um, so the jump operator is the lowering operator, sigma GE. Its conjugate is the raising operator, sigma EG. So when I multiply those two things together, I just get the excited state population, or sigma EE. And if again, you know, I kind of color code or separate the deterministic and jump parts, uh, I get something like that. And now, just to kind of show you the physical difference between these kind of white and yellow terms, um, I'm just going to explicitly write out the equations of motion. Okay, so in particular, uh, in the ground excited state basis, my uh, my density matrix would be rho gg, rho ge, rho eg, rho ee, um, where I define rho alpha beta as the overlap between a state alpha rho and the state beta. Um, in this two by two matrix form, I also have you know sigma ee. It's just uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. Uh, sigma GE is 0, 1, 0, 0, et cetera. Um, and now I can just, you know, just brute force multiply these two by two matrices uh, together. And what I get is the following. So I get rho EE is minus gamma naught rho EE. Okay, so then you see that you know, I took the right guess. Um, this says my, my excited state population is decaying exponentially uh, as a function of time. If I have an exponential decay of population, I also have to have an exponential decay of uh, coherence. And you know you can kind of almost guess what the last equation has to be. I have to preserve the trace of my density matrix. So any population that I'm losing in the excited state has to be going into uh, the ground state. Okay, so um, and I, again, I color coded this yellow because this yellow term is coming from this term here. Um, so this is just one particular example, but this kind of structure is quite uh, generic. So in particular, um, now you have this kind of interpretation that this deterministic part here uh, deals with the loss of population or coherence. And then the jump term uh, describes where the population goes. Um, does that make sense, or are there any questions? I've got a question. Yeah? So the off-diagonal terms, they're also decaying. So is this like a general property of the Lindblad maturization? Um, I think it's not just Lindblad, but I think it's quite general. So in particular, imagine I have, um, so imagine I had two states initially populated as a coherent superposition, let's say G plus E. So if I take away population from E, 
So, so in that initial state has coherence between G and E, but it kind of makes sense if I take away population. So if, I, if my final state is just G, because all the population in E disappeared, it's clear that if I don't have population in E, I can't have coherence either. So that's why you can't really lose population without losing coherence as well. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a, a, a property of the Lindblad per se, but it's just a kind of physical general statement. Okay, so um, I'm sorry. I realize I should, uh, in case there's questions online, let me close. The presentation. Uh, oh, okay, so there was a question, what is sigma EE? Uh, so in the matrix form, it's you know, this 0, 0, 0, 1. But if you want to explicitly write it out as a cat and bra, it's the you know, E times E. Okay. Um, so Given the fact that you know the deterministic and jump parts you know physically look like or describe very different physical processes, um, that might motivate a kind of rewriting of the density matrix itself. Um, so in particular, what I can do is I can try to group the deterministic part of the Lindblad into an effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Uh, describing evolution, okay? So then when you do that, you get uh, D rho. It looks like there's another question. Sorry? Can the sigma... Uh, so, I'm sorry, Mane, I, I see your question, but I, I'm not sure I understand uh, the question. So maybe if you can rephrase it, I, I can try to give a better explanation. Um, so well, well, so while uh, while he's doing that, let me just kind of finish this thought here. Um, so if I do this regrouping, then I what I'll get is an effective non-Hermitian Hamiltonian. Okay. Where again, I've just separated the jumps from the deterministic part. And then this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian uh, is the Hermitian Hamiltonian minus I over 2 and the sum of the jump operators CI dagger CI. Yes? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Right, I'm, I'm sloppy about it. Right, this is all row S. Yeah, so a abstractly, um, I think it's better illustrated with this specific example because the, the pattern is exactly the same, all right? So 
my claim is mathematically, you know, I can choose any operator C here. And this is some legal form of a density matrix. So at least in principle, it's physically allowed by, by nature. Um, so here, what I'm doing is I'm trying to choose CI to describe a particular physical process, which is that you start with one single atom in an excited state, and I want to model some kind of uh, uh, dissipative dynamics where this excited state population just kind of exponentially decays into the ground state here. So this is not a, it's not a unitary evolution. Um, so I'm going to choose this jump operator C, which is proportional to the spin lowering operator. Um, if you want, you know, this is kind of coming from intuition if you've used master equations before. If not, you can just take this as a kind of lucky guess. Um, so then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, this jump operator and plug it into this Lindblad form. All right? um, so then I get you know, minus gamma naught over 2 uh, sigma EE, which is my excited state population operator times rho plus the Hermitian conjugate minus this jump term. And so then my claim is that when I write out this entire evolution equation, uh, in terms of the individual matrix elements, uh, these terms here, these deterministic terms, give rise to these three evolution equations here. So it just says that when my excited state, if I have excited state population, it's going to exponentially decay. Uh, if I have coherence, it's going to exponentially decay. Um, and then this last term says that, okay, if I have decay of population, it has to go somewhere. And this jump term says where it goes. Um, and so uh, it's a little bit abstract to see, but with some experience, for example, working with uh, this master equation, you'll see that it's a general pattern. This deterministic part says that something bad is happening, or you know, some population or, or, or coherence is disappearing. And this last term is you know, kind of compensating for that by telling you into which new state uh, are you going into. Okay. Um, so I, I leave that as a, a claim. Uh, but you can see that specifically in, in this example here. Okay, so hopefully that uh, clarified the different terms in this uh, equation. Um, so I introduced you know, all this uh, formalism to give you a sense of what equations we're ultimately going to be solving. If you want a full legal description of an open system, you, know, you should be solving these density matrix equations. Uh, so for a, a single spin one half, you get four equations. Uh, if you have you know, more spins, then these equations become huge. We plug into a computer you know, and so your computer says no way. Um, uh, but then, kind of going forward, uh, I'll also, I think this might be like the last time I formally write down a density matrix, okay? So going forward, I'm really only going to, you know, instead of writing out this long object here, uh, I think for the most part, I'm only going to be writing down the effective Hamiltonian, okay? So you can understand that two ways. Uh, so uh, one way, reason I do that is just it's easier, it's a shorthand. Okay, and then the interpretation is that, you know, if you want to go back and really calculate dynamics or, or come up with a fully legal uh, equation, you know, you have to kind of, you know, take this, re-separate out the jump terms and write out the full master equation and, and solve that, okay? Um, but this is just kind of easier or faster to write down. Um, and indeed, you know, uh, H, it's effective itself, is not... Uh, proper, because if I somehow wrote down the Schrodinger equation only with H effective and not the full density matrix, I would have the problem that if I start with a pure state wave function, the amplitude or the norm of it decreases in time. Okay, so if, if I only evolved under this non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, I would generally have the property that DDD of the norm of my state
uh, would be shrinking in time. So again, it's not, that's just to say it's not legal. Um, on the other hand, even though this is all formally true, it turns out that there's some very relevant limits where I can get away with solving only the non-Hermitian dynamics, okay? Um, so in particular, uh, let's imagine that I try to solve just the wave function evolution like this. So I have the problem that my norm would generally be decreasing because I have a dissipative component. Um, so, so I guess the point is that solving uh, this kind of differential equation for a state vector is much easier or takes much less computational effort than solving this kind of matrix equation, right? Because it's, it's a vector versus a matrix. Um, and even though what I'm saying, you know, even though in general this you know, can't be a full description, um, it's actually OK um, in two different circumstances. Um, so one is if you know where our population is going. after a jump. Um, so if we just go back to the simple example of a two-level system, uh, if I, so my effective Hamiltonian would actually be anti-Hermitian. Okay, so if, if this object here was real, then I can interpret that as a kind of uh, real frequency or energy for the excited state. The fact that it's imaginary tells me that my excited state is actually losing population in time. So then if I you know, took a general state on Zots, that my state is some superposition of ground state and excited state, I would have uh, the problem that my excited state amplitude is uh, exponentially decaying. in time, okay, so my state vector is shrinking. Um, but it's okay, because in this case, the, simple, the problem is so simple that I know that you know, this is physically because uh, some quantum jump is happening, and because of the simple structure of my, my system, I know that there's only one quantum jump. So when excited state is disappearing, I physically know that it has to be going to the ground state. Okay, so um, that is, you know, just from the wave function alone, I know that any loss of amplitude or norm of loss of norm is physically because I'm adding more population to the ground state. So from the wave function, I can actually go back and reconstruct my full density matrix just by kind of good intuition or good guessing. Right. Um, a second limit, uh, which is actually very relevant for a number of you know, quantum information applications, is the following. Um, so the second case, where you can only use, where you, it's, it suffices just to use the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, um, is if any loss of population is considered to be bad. Um, just to kind of illustrate what that means, imagine you have some quantum protocol. This could be something like a state transfer protocol, quantum memory, some kind of gate. And your ideal target would be that you start with some state psi of t uh, at zero time. And ideally, Uh, that state would evolve under a pure Hermitian Hamiltonian, so pure unitary evolution. So this is kind of ideal. 
and then you would reach some you know, desired target state at later time. So this final state could be an entangled state following a gate, or you know, this could be a, some trivial state, and then you do a quantum computation and arrive at your final desired answer. And then the idea is that during this kind of time evolution, uh, you could have these jump operators kicking in and just kind of kicking you into new states, which are not the answer that you want. So you don't really care what state it is particularly. You just know that that state is bad, right? Because it's not giving you the desired target. So as long as you don't really care what that state is, you can actually ignore it. So for example, now if I were to evolve under the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, if I see that my final state amplitude is 80%, then I know my protocol would have succeeded 80% of the time. 20% of the time, it would have failed. Um, my evolution under the uh, effective Hamiltonian doesn't tell me which state I failed into, but I don't care, right? Because you know, if it didn't work, uh, you know, that's the end of the story. Um, so, uh, so this is a case that we'll encounter, I think, several times over the lectures because we'll be trying to use uh, atom-light interactions to do something good. And then if it fails, you know, we just want to understand how likely that is without really caring about you know, what's the new state following the failure. Okay. And, and so that's why it's sufficient for many cases of interest to actually work with the non-Hermitian Hamiltonian, even though it's not strictly a complete description of quantum mechanics. Any questions on that? Yep. Are the jump operators always um, like conjugate of each other, or can they be, for example, Hermitian? They can be. Um, yeah. So they can be anything. Um, so if it's a dissipation, then it tends to be like a kind of lowering operator. So for example, if I had a, not a spin system, but a harmonic oscillator, so I just have a mass on a spring, I have friction, then my jump operator would be proportional to the bosonic lowering operator. Okay, so I have you know, ex, uh, phonons or photons that are just disappearing. Um, if I had, on the other hand, so uh, this is not Hermitian. On the other hand, I could have a jump operator uh, let's say if I have a spin system, something like sigma z, which is Hermitian, this would actually represent uh, dephasing or decoherence. So the idea is that I could have coherence initially between ground and excited state. This jump operator acting on my state would just erase the coherence um, while maintaining population. So yeah, like c could be anything, really. Uh, Hi. In this equation, uh, are we considering any interaction between the VAT and the system, or are we in the vacuum? Uh, so in, in, are you talking about this specific example here? Exactly. Um, So I, I, would, I would generally say that as long as the Markovian approximation holds. So I'm not sure. If, maybe I'll try to reinterpret or rephrase your question. You can tell me if this is kind of what you're asking. So here, I, I didn't send in any photons. So I don't have any coherent driving, for example, that would really create Rabi oscillations. Um, but I could do that. And so, so in that case, my, my, my bath would not be vacuum because I'm physically sending in photons to drive you know, uh, population back and forth. Um, it doesn't really change the validity of the master equation itself. So if you were to physically send in stuff through your bath, uh, most of the time you can actually just add it in as a separate coherent driving term. So that's actually kind of abstract, but um, uh, actually now I'll show, I'll, I'll try to give a more concrete example in terms of chiral waveguide QED, and maybe that statement will be more, will become more concrete. Okay, thank you. Uh, Uh, there's one question in the back. I 
So I try to understand what is the population loss, in the case the any loss of population is bad, would be, physically speaking, it's a decay into another state if don't, uh, that don't ground stage, uh, intermediate stage. I don't know, I, I try visualizing, visualizing this thing, but I, I can't. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it, for a simple system, you can try to you know, come up with a specific illustration, but in general, it can actually just be arbitrarily complicated. So, you know, for example, we can take the, you know, one of the quantum simulation examples that Marcello presented today, where you're trying to kind of quantum simulate some, you know, lattice gauge theory. And he kind of mentioned an experiment, okay, like, you hope that it works, you know, you, you hope that you're evolving under uh, ideal Hamiltonian, but once in a while, some of the experiment just goes wrong. So what goes wrong could actually be pretty arbitrary, right? It could be that you, you physically have an atom there, and then you look later and just really just disappeared. Or it could be that your, your, your atom was excited, and, and then it kind of decayed into the wrong state uh, without you wanting it to. So is there just anything, so, so I guess the general picture is you have this ideal Hamiltonian that you're usually trying to implement perfectly, and then just anything wrong that can happen would physically be described by some type of you know, jump operator here, pr provided that it's a Markovian process, yeah. So, so this thing is, depends on the, the system, but it just, you know, if you have some experimental sense of what's going wrong in your system, uh, you know, CI is just some mathematical representation of that. I don't know if that kind of answers your question. Okay, so um, so this is kind of abstract, you know, introduction or a review of of open quantum systems and the Lindblad master equation, um, and to provide a little bit more kind of physical connection. Uh, Let's go back to chiral waveguide QED, okay? Um, so remember that in chiral waveguide QED, or even just for atom-light interactions in general, um, if we have uh, a lot of atoms, recall that's actually a very complex problem. So, you know, I could have a collection of two-level systems, uh, atoms, you know, if I have something like 10 to the 4 atoms, which is not unrealistic in a real experiment, you know, the dimension of the Hilbert space, if each one is a two-level system, would then be 2 to the n, so 2 to the 10,000, okay? Um, you could have the atomic positions, which could be moving in time, etc. And then on top of that, you have the photons, which could have any color, be propagating in any direction, et cetera, uh, the dimension of the Hilbert space um, is infinite. Okay. Um, so we saw specifically for chiral waveguide QED, it's solved by, by beta ansatz, but in particular, it's really only useful when the number of photons you send in is quite limited. And so we know that in general we can't use beta ansatz. We also know in general that you know this giant Hilbert space looks pretty, uh, you know, scary to try and deal with. Okay, so we have to you know find some way to simplify the problem. Okay, and you know from my introduction yesterday, my claim was that in traditional quantum optics, what people essentially did is you you try to ignore the granularity of the atoms. You try to describe the atoms as some smooth macroscopic quantum field, so you turn it into a quantum field theory. I argue as well as that once you kind of smooth out the atoms or forget about positions, you lose any notion of multiple scattering and weight of interference, okay? Um, so kind of, you know, trying to cross out this part of uh, the Hilbert space, that doesn't work. 
or I argued that you, you kind of leave out potentially important physics. And so then, you know, by kind of process of elimination, if we can't deal with this whole thing, if we can't cross this thing out, then whether you like it or not, the only thing you can try is to cross this out. Okay, so we're going to try and integrate out the photons. Uh, once you integrate out the photons, that's why, you know, that's when a kind of master equation will naturally present itself. So you go from a closed system of atoms and photons to an open system description of atoms alone. Okay. Um, so, so the goal basically is to integrate out the photons. And you know, already from that level of discussion, you can maybe kind of, I mean, I don't actually know the whole history of why people invented quantum optics or formulated quantum optics the way they did, but you can kind of appreciate that that sounds kind of unnatural, right? Because what do you do in quantum optics? You shine in a field. You want to see the field coming out and, and you know, measure the field. And what I'm telling you kind of oddly is the way to calculate that is to integrate out the field from the very beginning. Um, so now let me kind of show you that maybe it's not as strange as it sounds. Um, Um, so the first step in this procedure of integrating out the field uh, is to realize that it's formally easy uh, to write the fields Solution, okay? So remember that if we start from a Hamiltonian that includes both the atoms of photons explicitly, uh, you know, then uh, yesterday I showed that, you know, you can write down the Heisenberg equation of motion for the field. And then kind of intuitively you get a wave equation, a Maxwell-like wave equation Uh, where your atoms act as sources, okay? And so in conventional quantum optics, people really try to treat the field as a real degree of freedom. So you, you try to solve this equation and the equations for the field. But, you know, structurally, this is a first order partial differential equation. So it's actually extremely easy to solve. Um, so in particular, you can either try to solve it directly or kind of check for yourself uh, that the following is a solution. So this part of the wave equation just means that I have some notion of uh, uh, translation in space and time. Okay, so let me kind of explain the, the terms more carefully. So this is what you would call like the kind of total field. So I, I might be interested in calculating correlations, functions of the total field. So for example, A dagger A would be intensity. A dagger squared A squared would be the so-called G2 function in quantum optics. And what this equation physically says is that the total field is not really an independent degree uh, of freedom. It's not an independent variable because on one hand, it depends on what you might call the input field. So the total field is what you send in. Um, this would also, in usual differential equation language, be the homogeneous part of the solution. So this is the solution without any atoms. So your total field is what you send in. 
plus what you might call a scattered component, you know, the field that's being emitted by the atoms. And you see there, there's, there's this kind of translational structure to the problem. So in particular, uh, if I define Z as my kind of observation point, so if I have an atom ZI that's before Z, I have this uh, step function, which means that at an observation point, uh, I only see a scattered field, my atom is to the left. That's because I have a chiral structure where the atoms can only emit to the right. Um, but furthermore, it depends on the atoms at a retarded time. Okay. So that kind of makes sense. It's not, you know, you'd have exactly the same kind of structure in free space. Uh, if you have a source some distance away, you know about the source at a particular time, uh, or, or what you measure from the source at a particular time actually reveals the state of the source at a previous time, because light propagates at a finite speed. Okay. Um, So then, uh, step two uh, is that you can substitute that expression for the total field into the Heisenberg equations of motion for the atoms. Um, so for example, if I looked at the atomic uh, lowering operator of atom I, uh, the Heisenberg equation would be the commutator of I times uh, the total H of the system of, of atoms and photons, and sigma GE of atom I. Um, so I gave the, the full Hamiltonian yesterday, and it's just a, you know, a bit of, of algebra to actually evaluate the commutation uh, relation. Um, so if you do that, I'll just kind of give the final answer. So let me write it out and explain then the physical meaning. Uh, sorry, just to make sure I have space. Um. Okay, so it's a bit of a long equation, but uh, I think the individual terms make sense. Um, so this says that you know, atom I, on one hand, is driven by the input field, uh, which you know, kind of makes sense. I think that also kind of answers your question that, in principle, you're allowed to have any arbitrary input fields. And you'll just have, you'll, from the standpoint of the atoms, it just looks like some external driving. Um, and then uh, you know, the point is that atom I will be driven by the total field, but the total field is the input plus 
the fields scattered from other atoms. Okay? So this represents uh, the interaction of atom I with the field coming from other atoms. Uh, you see that there's a kind of step function here. So atom I can only see atoms J that are to the left. And they see atom J at a retarded time. And finally, there's a, a self-interaction term. So the, the field being emitted by the atom comes back and does work on the atom itself. Um, and this actually leads to kind of single atom spontaneous emission. So here's a kind of, so this is kind of uh, an external driving term. Uh, this is what you might call the self term. So the work done uh, on a single atom by its own emitted field and this is driving uh, from other atoms. Okay, so these are Heisenberg equations in motion rather than a density matrix. Uh, but you can also, you can probably kind of qualitatively see that it's not Markovian, right? Which is just to say that if you truly and exactly integrate out some degrees of freedom, you'll get the, you know, uh, the remaining degrees of freedom, uh, the evolution in, in principle depends on the system at previous times. Okay, so that's a very ugly equation uh, to solve. Um, so what we would like, or hope for, is you know, wouldn't these equations be much nicer? if I could replace uh, this retarded term approximately with uh, the operator of atom J at the same time. Okay, so that uh, gets rid of the non-locality in time and brings me towards a Markovian uh, structure. Um, so let me try to just argue in pictures uh, why that's valid or when it's valid. Um, so let's just take a, take a very single, simple example of two atoms. So imagine I had a waveguide. I have one atom here, which is up in the excited state. Uh, I have another atom here, which let's say is also up in the excited state. And say that you know, this kind of system, these two atoms have some uh, separation length L between them. Okay. Um, so what it means to kind of physically ignore retardation is the following. Um, so retardation basically means that, you know, or ignoring retardation basically means that, you know, from the standpoint of uh, this atom two, it sees the effect of atom one instantaneously. Okay. Um, so it, to, to define what's instantaneous and not, we have to consider what's the natural time scale of dynamics of the problem. And the natural time scale is going to be the single atom spontaneous emission time. Right, so uh, stuff that happens much faster than you know one over the decay rate should be considered instantaneous from the atomic perspective. And so instantaneous then basically means um, that this length scale, or this time scale tau, um, should be much bigger than the time it takes for an emitted photon from atom one to propagate to atom two. Okay, so the propagation time will be the system size uh, divided by the speed of light. Okay. Um, so this you can kind of rewrite uh, as um, so the condition then is you know, gamma uh, 1D times the system size 
over C. Um, this should be much smaller than 1. So as long as that's true, then I can make that a replacement uh, uh, that I mentioned there. And this is actually where we're very lucky with physical atoms. Okay? Um, so this kind of uh, time scale tau, so you know, in real numbers, a typical spontaneous emission rate for an atom might be a few megahertz. Um, that means that, uh, uh, for, for, so for this kind of uh, inequality to be true, if gamma 1 is a few megahertz, then my system length Uh, then kind of translates, so, so if gamma 1D is kind of megahertz, uh, then my system length should be less than a few meters. Okay, so that's pretty easily satisfied. If you can somehow make a Bose-Einstein condensate that's the size of this room, then this Markovian approximation would not work, but then that's your problem. Okay? But as long as your BEC or cold atom ensemble you know, fits within a kind of small vacuum chamber, then this approximation is essentially perfect. Okay. Um, so maybe now is a, a good time to take a break. I, I'm actually not completely done, but maybe what we can do is uh, we'll cut into this kind of exercise section uh, session uh, 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 by a few minutes for me to kind of finish this story, um, and then we, uh, I'll introduce the, the exercises for you. Um, so, any questions on this? How can I think of this uh, sigma uh, GE, um, like time evolution? Because, okay, I see we're in the Heisenberg picture, but like, how can I think about it physically? Like, what would this thing mean? Like, it corresponds to like some kind of, you know, what, like, uh, like cat bra, like GE, but like, you know what? Yeah. So I the well, right. It? So the expectation value of this would. Uh, uh, let me give a very physical example. So imagine that we just had Rabi oscillations, right? So I have a Hamiltonian, a pure uh, Hamiltonian that was omega sigma x. Okay. So I I drive. Uh, oscillations between the ground and excited state. So if I look at it as a function of time, uh, my excited state population would be doing that. So this would be my excited state population. My ground state uh, would be doing that. And the atomic coherence is basically, you know, how much superposition do I have between ground and excited state? So any time at I'm, I'm at either full excited state population or full ground state, that would be zero. And then, you know, I guess it would look, well, yeah, something like that, right? So this would be the expectation value of sigma GE. So it just says, so, so if it's non-zero, I have some coherence between my ground and excited state. And you know, if you if you replace this kind of driving with just a classical number like a Rabi frequency, uh, it would be exactly this. I mean, so if you solve the Heisenberg equation for this thing, it would look exactly like that. Okay, I have uh, one question. Uh, is it not clear to me why tau is is this the relevant time scale? Because I would expect a sort of phase uh, that is coming from the atoms that is uh, emitting from a certain distance that is encoded in this t minus uh, the distance. Right. So it's not clear to me why this tau is the important thing and not uh, if it is within a wavelength or something or I don't know, like. Yeah, y yeah you're exactly right. So if I had done the calculation, um, it goes back to the, uh, the approximation or, or if you want a uh, frame of reference that I chose yesterday. So. Remember yesterday I said that if I have this kind of chiral dispersion relation that has no you know ends, uh, you know I could say that my resonance frequency is anywhere. So physically it would be you know omega naught, but I could also just as well set my resonance frequency of the atoms to be zero, 
And so then a, a zero frequency has no phase. So e to the i kz, the k would be zero. Um, if you did properly you know, put in the resonance frequency, let's say something non-zero, you would have a kind of resonant wave vector, you know, of omega naught over c. Uh, that would feed into all these equations, so you'd have k naughts appearing here. Um, but then as long as you included those k naughts, it would not destroy the validity of this argument here. So, so the, the, the final master equation, if you want, would have a k naught inside, but the validity of it, you can easily, it is all coming from this kind of picture here. So, so the, the, wave, the, the length scale is not the resonant wavelength. It is you know, this kind of consideration here. Yeah, because the, com the comparison with respect to the total system size, uh, OK, but why this tau? Why this uh, 1 over gamma 1d? It's not clear to me physically. Right. So maybe another way to say it is, like, if I just had one atom, then what I'll show next is that, so this self-term leads to a, a spontaneous emission of the atom. Um, this, the, the term coming from other atoms, what it physically can uh, lead to, for example, is stimulated emission. So an atom is excited by if I send in a photon, I can try to force the atom to release its excitation even faster. So that, that's kind of what's physically encoded in a term like that. And so um, this kind of inequality here, that basically allows for the stimulated emission. Right? So if these two systems were too far apart, this second atom would have completely emitted the photon in the first place before the photon coming from the first atom would have a chance to hit it. Um, so, so this equation here really means that you know, this atom barely has a chance to release that excitation, and the photon coming from the first atom already has a chance to interact and try to stimulate the process. Thank you. Uh, professor, about that last explanation that you uh, just gave, can, how can I see that as a justification to use the Markov approximation that as example? Uh, so that's what I'll write. Items. So I'll, I'll, I'll write down the corresponding master equation. Uh, I'll claim it's true. And actually, the exercise is for you to show uh, that okay. there's a corresponding master equation for it. OK. But phenomena, phenomenologically, how can I see that about that argument that you just gave? That the second atom, the probability to have an, an, a spontaneous emission is really low. But the first one is not low, so I will have that kind of stuff. Can I see that as a way to say that my system is Markovian, for instance, in the context of that example of the two atoms? Um, I think not. So. I'm not sure if this is what you're asking. So, uh, I mean, here I, I try to give a physical explanation of what's encoded, right? That the, the, the excitation coming for the first atom can hit the second and try to stimulate emission. That's the physical interpretation. So if you were to go and solve these equations mathematically, you would see that the physics that I described is encoded in that answer. The, the non-Markovian nature itself is just a statement that, uh, you know, in general, when I integrate out of bath, I get this non-local equation of time, so d dt of sigma g e at time t depends on uh, part of the system at previous times because you know light has retardation to propagate from one point to another. So you know the essentially you could almost take by definition a Markovian process is one where somehow everything becomes time local. So then the question is simply when can I ignore uh, this term here and replace you know this retarded time just by the current time. Um, so, so I try to give some kind of, you know, physical arguments or some simple limits where you can kind of believe uh, what are the conditions. But in general, to, to prove it, you know, so the only way you can really prove it is like you would have to solve the approximate set of equations and the real one and compare what's the error. So my claim is the error is indeed kind of set by this scale here. Uh, but you can really only do that in, in very, so, so this problem you can't actually solve exactly and establish that this is true. I mean, if I give you, you know, many atoms and many excitations, uh, you can kind of hope that it's true, or you can try to use intuition, but you can't really do this one-to-one -one comparison. I think I got it. Thank you. 
Okay, I think that we can leave uh, further questions for the next section. Uh, otherwise, we'll not have some coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Okay.